so uh, let's get started. Uh, so thanks everybody for coming. Uh, I'm Anthony Skelton, I'm the Associate Director of the Robert Institute of Philosophy and also Associate Professor of Philosophy here at Western. Uh, and it's my job today, um, which I'm happy to report, to introduce the speaker. So our speaker today is Julian Savalescu. Uh, Julian comes to us today from Oxford University where he's the Yujiro Chair in Practical Ethics and also the Director of the Hero Centre for Practical Ethics and also the Welcome Centre for Ethics uh, and Humanities. Uh, and he also directs the Oxford Center for Mirror Ethics and the Institute for Science and Ethics. Uh, he's the editor of the Journal of Medical Ethics, maybe long-suffering editor of the Journal of Medical Ethics, uh, and uh, he has published more than 250 articles and is the editor of uh, many books and also the author of a great book called Unfit for the Future with uh, Mark Pearson. Um, and he's, of course, a world leader in the area of applied ethics, having published on pretty much every topic that you can imagine under that uh, rubric. And he's the founding editor with uh, Roger Crisp, his colleague at Oxford, of the Journal of Practical Ethics. Please join me now in welcoming our speaker, who's going to talk today on bio, a human bio and action. Thanks very much, Anthony. And, uh, can you hear me uh, well enough at the back? Do I need to use a microphone? Do, do you want me to use a microphone? It's up to you, the audience. So I'm, <laughs> I can hear myself. <laughs> well, let me know if you, if you can't hear me clearly enough. So I'd like to begin by thanking the Rotman Institute and, and Chris Schenk for the invitation um, to come here. I've had a fantastic week. And I, it's my first trip to Canada. And uh, I've been to lots of places in the world and many events like this. And I declare the Canadians the most hospitable people I've ever encountered. <laughs> Had amazing organisation from Deborah Fox and, uh, and hosting by, by Anthony. And uh, I've been wined and dined. And every sort of minute of my day has been meticulously planned by Deborah, which is what you want when you're uh, having to go to a foreign place. So I really want to thank you. And I've really enjoyed meeting uh, some of the students. And I, I hope we can continue this collaboration. So it's a public lecture, uh, so no one's going to be happy. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to start with a, a kind of very quick sort of sketch, a sort of a thumbnail sketch of the possibilities of human enhancement, and then uh, why we might need human enhancement, and then spend the last half talking about how we should make decisions about these sorts of issues. So talking about the ethics. So for the students, you know, this is really a, I've been interested in this field and working in this field for, for 20 years. Um, so this is a distillation of, of 20 years into 45 minutes. So it's not going to be very satisfactory. And I'm sorry if it goes very quickly and you find it superficial and hopefully we can delve into it in the question time. So what do I mean by human bioenhancement? Here I'm talking about modification uh, of human beings that goes beyond medical treatment for disease. So in this field, there's a standard distinction between health uh, and disease or between normality and subnormality and between treatment and enhancement. I'm going to talk about the enhancement bit. Now, this distinction, I think, is very difficult to defend um, and m largely because it's a statistical definition. So disease is typically sub-functioning two standard deviations below the mean. So 2% of you know, people have intellectual disability. 2% of people are blind. 2% of people are deaf, deaf. But that figure is purely arbitrary. Um, you could have defined disease as one standard deviation below the mean or below average. Um, it's been quite a useful way of deciding what to research, what to give people excuses for. But there isn't any firm ethical value associated with this statistical point. But nonetheless, I'm going to take that because that's what the debate is around. So to give you some examples of the sorts of things I'm talking about, doping in sport is the most familiar example. I'm going to talk about that in a moment. Um, who thinks doping should be, uh, we should change the rules to allow for <coughs> physical enhancement or doping in sport? So, four. Cognitive enhancement using smart drugs. Now, these, in, these are around in the form of modafinil, Ritalin and Adderall. But let's assume you could increase 
a person's IQ from 100 to 160. Who thinks it should be permissible to increase your IQ from 100 to 160? So again, a minority. This is sort of like tracking the sort of average population surveys. Designer babies, who thinks people should be able to use whole genome analysis to select more intelligent or more athletically or musically gifted embryos? Again, a few hardcore enhancers. <laughs> Love drugs, who thinks you should be able to take drugs to improve the quality of your relationship? Okay, we're getting, we're getting down now. Um, Hormonal castration of paedophiles to reduce their sex drive. This is legal in like five or six states in the United States. It's practiced in various parts of the world. I don't know about Canada. Uh, I presume not. <laughs> it's a you know, fairly, um, fairly reasonable society. But who thinks that uh, hormonal castration of paedophiles should be permissible? One person now. You're my friend. So I'm going to try and defend all of these practices. Um, and we'll, well, I'll return to them at the end. Of course, enhancement is already in, in practice in medicine. Abortion, sterilization, contraception, circumcision, cosmetic surgery. These are all modifying normal human characteristics to achieve certain sorts of values. But I'm not gonna talk about those because most people accept them. I wanna talk about the things that most of you think shouldn't be permitted. Start with the most familiar example, Lance Armstrong. Um, has shown that doping is effective, it's difficult to determine, and it's very prevalent. I thought I'd put this slide up for you. The dirtiest race in history, the 1988 Seoul Olympics, won by the most famous Canadian, Ben Johnson. Um, it's actually this guy in the middle. I, he, he, he came fourth, but after they rubbed out Johnson, he came third, but he actually would have won the race if they had eliminated everyone who was doping. Um, so, and, and that's actually the pattern. Uh, Werner Frank, an expert on doping, has said in every 100 metres, roughly six out of eight people will be doping. And that's what history has shown. Um, there's only been 10 people who have run under 9.8 seconds in the world. And there's only one who hasn't been implicated in doping. And as Lance Armstrong famously said, I dare to dream. Um, but for everyone else besides Usain Bolt, if you run under 9.8 seconds, you're probably doping, because that's the limit of human uh, capacity. An independent reanalysis of the London Olympics by Michael Ashenden estimated that one third of the medals, this is prior to the fancy bears and the, 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 the revelations of Icarus and so on about the Russian doping uh, scandal, one third of the medals, he estimated, involved doping. And some of those turned out to be Russian athletes, but many of them weren't. Um, so enhancement is with us. Um, I want to argue here that there's nothing special about normality. I want to adopt what you might call a Darwinian view of human nature and capacity and not some higher order view that humans were designed by God or by, for some specific finely balanced function. And according to Darwin, humans are just the blind products of evolution. They weren't designed to be happy, they weren't designed to be saints, they were designed to survive long enough to reproduce. And they evolved as other non-human animals in certain environments and those environments shaped who survived and what capacities they had. But through most of human history, which is about 200,000 years old, the human condition was moving in groups of 150, competing for resources, cooperating with your group, uh, being responsible for your acts but not responsible for your omissions, uh, having morals that evolved to facilitate small group cooperation uh, and prevent free riding within that group, but not to cooperate with our group, our group members or to operate in a globalised society. So in evolutionary terms, we are the same as our hunter-gatherer ancestors. And one of the other, I'll return to those moral features of Homo sapiens, but another feature of a Darwinian view of human beings is that every characteristic about us varies. 
in a normal distribution. So this is the curve for hematocrit, the percentage of red blood cells in blood. It could be height, level of growth hormone, intelligence, level of self-control, empathy, whatever it is that you want to measure, it's going to vary between individuals. Variation within, between individuals is a rule. We're not all born equal, we're all born different to a degree. Now, through most of human history, those differences served our survival. But today, they mean that some people have great opportunities of life in life, and some people don't. So just to take one example, IQ. So this is some data from Linda Gottfriedson. Um, and I'm not saying here IQ is purely biologically determined. Most estimates put it at 50% heritable. But there's a genetic contribution to IQ. So where you fall on this curve is going to determine what sort of life you have and what sort of jobs are open to you and what sort of choices you're going to have. And even the US military has recognised this. And at the time of the Second World War, they excluded normal people from being foot soldiers. And today they only accept the top 70% of people. Every year, the US Department of Education conducts effectively an IQ test of the American population called the Nat National Adult Literacy Survey. And it, it divides people into five groups. The lowest two groups constitute nearly 50% of the population. And they estimate, or they claim, that people with this level of cognitive ability lack the capacities to enjoy the rights and fulfill the responsibilities of citizenship. Now, that's clearly in large part due to education and social environment, but it's also partly due to biology, differences in biology. Uh, so this is an example where natural... So at this end, you've got intellectual disability. But in a technologically advanced society that we've created, being, there's now described, low normal between 70 and 85 is a disadvantage but it's not a disease. And insofar as we can use biological agents to change that, in my view, we ought to consider it in the same way as we would consider better educational interventions or better dietary interventions. Another thing that matters to us our, as social animals are our relationships. So divorce has now exceeded death as the major uh, the major factor or the major cause of relationship breakup. And in some parts of the US, divorce runs at 50% of marriages. Now, why is that? A number of explanations. One is that women are wealthier, more independent, able to make choices. One of the explanations is that we didn't evolve to have 30-year 30 30 monogamous lifelong relationships. As I said, in evolutionary terms, we're very similar to our ancestors 100,000 years ago. So through most of human history, we existed in what's called the EEA, the Environment of Evolutionary Adaptiveness. Um, and in this lifespan, in, in, this, in this environment, people had many relationships and short lifespans. The average duration of a marriage is seven to 10 years. So the, the main, so the seven year itch captures a feature of human beings. The peak of breakups are between seven to 10 years. So what would have been the average length uh, of a, a marriage in, in the traditional environment for human beings? Well, given a life expectancy of about 30, at least 50% of marriages would have ended within 15 years, usually due to the death of one of the partners. So, we can look at recent hunter-gatherer societies, the, the Arche in eastern Paraguay. Women had 10 marriages by the age of 30. Uh, they, had, they had roughly uh, eight uh, children um, and half of them survived to 40. This was what Thomas Hobbes described as a la life that was nasty, brutish and short. And this is the natural state for human beings. Um, and so most, of, most relationships would have ended by seven to 10 years. So 
One of the reasons we can postulate for um, a divorce rate of 50% is that we're not disposed to have very long-lasting relationships. That doesn't mean we can't. We can't overcome the direction that our nature pushes it in, but it means there is a pressure. And insofar as we can change that with drugs like oxytocin or other substances that will influence the quality and strength of our relationships, in my view, if our value is a single long relationship, then we ought to use that knowledge. Likewise, if our value is to end a relationship without continuing obsession, insofar as we can use drugs to help us achieve that, we ought to consider the risks and benefits. Already, the US military uh, has been using propranolol to reduce the laying down of memories to prevent post-traumatic stress disorder. Some people like Leon Cass and others have said this is wrong. People ought, to re or ought not to avoid the memory of horrific acts. But if you have a young girl that's been horribly raped and a drug can reduce the emotional impact, in my view, it ought to be offered to her for her to make a decision about whether she wants to continue to relive the trauma of that experience. Even our moral decisions are influenced by our biology. And of course they are, because everything that matters about us is determined by brain activity, and brain activity is influenced by a large number of other biological factors that are under external but also internal modulation. The most striking example of the influence of physiology over moral decisions, I think, comes from Israel in a study of judges that some of you may uh, know about. And this study looked at the willingness of judges to offer parole during the course of the day. And what it found was that there was a highly statistically significant increase in the willingness to offer parole the closer the case came to the time the judge last ate a meal. Um, now, maybe this study's wrong. Um, and maybe it's not related to blood sugar. Um, but it seems likely, and there's a lot of other evidence, sleep deprivation makes you more utilitarian. Uh, a, a messy desk makes you more severe in your punishments of people. There's vast amounts of it. A, a, the presence of an eye above an honesty box makes people behave more honestly. Three dots shaped like a face also makes them sh behave more honestly. But if you flip them around, uh, they don't behave any more honestly. We are very crude beings that process the world not as, as photographs and, as, and in direct correlation with reality. We have psychological heuristics and biases, attention, and a whole bunch of features of our nature that mean that we process reality in a certain way, and that affects our moral decisions. People are more willing to give when they see a single individual suffering uh, less willing and donate less when there's two and even less when there's four. So actually, Stalin was right. A hundred people are, is a tragedy. A million people dead is a statistic. So even the substances that circulate in our body influence our decision making. Testosterone is one example. A male trader's morning testosterone levels predict his profitability in a strong market. Testosterone reduces cognitive empathy, it reduces interpersonal trust, it reduces rejection of unfair offers, but it's associated with increased fair bargaining when people are unaware that they are taking testosterone. It doesn't increase aggressiveness, it increases concern with social status. So these aren't straightforwardly morally good or bad, but what it shows is that features that are largely beyond our control can influence quite fundamental parts of our behaviour. So that's all interesting. You might say, so what? Why should we be concerned about human enhancement? But as the case of the IQ curve shows, and I'll go on to talk about impulse control, normal is not good enough any longer. Just being healthy does not mean that you're going to have the best chance of the best life or that you're going to be an ideal moral citizen. 
So to give one example, a familiar example, through most of human history, we solved cooperation problems like the tragedy of the commons by observing the other members of our group of 150 and how often their cattle were grazing on the pasture and punishing free riders and seeing the effect of our actions and trusting each other and knowing each other. That's how we dealt with co cooperative dilemmas. Global collective action problems involve hundreds of millions of people who are anonymous. Your behaviour has no effect on the outcome. Uh, you don't trust other people. Uh, and the, the, the co common sense uh, drivers to moral behaviour of preventing harm don't kick in. That's why people don't cooperate around global collective action problems like um, climate change or antimicrobial resistance or poverty because we're not psychologically set up to operate at a highly abstract statistical distance uh, environment. Another example is terrorism. Um, Richard Posner estimates there, there's enough uh, plutonium floating around in the former Soviet Union to build over a, th a, th a thousand atomic bombs. Even more scary are biological weapons that could be constructed in a backyard laboratory. So there are 1% of the population are psychopaths, 70 million in the world. Whereas in the past, a psychopath could kill one or more recently, 100 people with an automatic weapon. It only takes one of those individuals to decide to create a biological weapon and the results could be disastrous. So normal human vari- and that's not to mention the ideologues, the fanatics and so on. So humanity, as Steven Pinker has said, has two sides. Uh, and he's completely correct that homicide has never been lower. Life has never been safer for us. But as technology exponentially increases, the risk that we face exponentially increases. Because not only can these technologies be used for massive benefit, they can also be used for existential destruction or ultimate harm, as Ingemar Persson and I described. So this is just a potted picture that the differences in our cognitive abilities, the differences in our moral capacities actually have implications for us and for the world that we live in. Could we change people to make them better from the inside? Of course we should have political and social and educational, dietary and all of these sorts of approaches. But should we also start to look at changing us ourselves from the inside? Well, the second largest export in the world is an enhancer, caffeine. We already have started down the road of human enhancement. Alcohol, recreational drugs are all crude forms of mood enhancement. Um, this is uh, <coughs> Ritalin, I think. No, this is Adderall, Ritalin, uh, Modafinil, human growth hormone, uh, deep brain stimulation, cosmetic surgery. These are all examples of humans desire to improve themselves. There are many different cognitive enhancers. Um, these will only grow in number as understanding of the brain increases and treatments for Alzheimer's disease and other forms of cognitive impairment can also improve people within the normal range. The most striking example of how normal is not good enough is the work of Walter Michel and the famous impulse control experiments, the so-called marshmallow experiments. Michel put four-year-old children in front of a marshmallow and said, if you don't eat this marshmallow, when I come back in 10 minutes time, I'll give you two marshmallows. You can see this on the internet, YouTube, kids sitting on their hands or looking up. Some of them just go straight for the marshmallow. And when he follows the children who didn't eat the marshmallow up, 10 years later, more friends, more motivation to succeed, um, higher SAT scores. This was more correlated with university entrance than was their IQ. So the ability to delay gratification, to give up a small reward now for a big reward later is fundamental to human success in economic terms and in social terms. If you're low on that, you're likely to end up in jail at the bottom of the socioeconomic scale. And that's why 10% of children are on Ritalin. Ritalin increases um, impulse control uh, and it also reduces aggressiveness. It's both, a, it's both a prudential or a welfare enhancement and a moral enhancer. So 
if you could identify the underlying biology of impulse control, there's a question. What level or what range is going to be optimum for the individual and for society? And it's not going to be the normal range because it's not going to just be the bottom 2%. It's going to be something else. Modafinil, another example of a widely used uh, a widely used enhancer, probably best described as a motivational enhancer. It increases task enjoyment. So again, this is something that the, the film Limitless was based on and is widely used. One of the commonest objections to human enhancement is that it's a positional good. It's only good if you have it and somebody else doesn't. Like being taller. So. If everyone stands on tippy toes, nobody sees any better. But in fact, for cognitive enhancement, it's both a, a non-positional and positional good. So based on lead abatement studies, so lead, actually I saw a study recently that lead kills more people than tobacco, even now, through uh, remaining lead in petrol and paint and, and pollution. The lead is a big de-enhancer, but based on the lead abatement studies in the sort of 70s where they removed and 80s when they removed lead from paint and petrol, people estimate, estimate that just a 3% increase in the population's IQ would add 1.5% to GDP and $150 billion to the US economy and reduce poverty by 25% and males in jail by 18% and welfare recipiency by 18%. If I had a social program that could do that, people would fall over themselves to implement it. But actually, Cognitive enhancement could achieve that. And that's why the US military, DARPA, is investing a lot of money looking at how to develop cognitive enhancement. One of their spokespeople said, even a small increase in the IQ of the 4.2 billion people in the world who are of working age would have similar economic benefits to the introduction of the internet. Because the internet and the computer is just an external form of cognitive enhancement. Um, so the stakes are high. S selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors like Prozac uh, increase cooperation, reduce criticism of others, result in a fairer distribution of resources, reduce rejection of unfair offers, increase aversion to harming others. These aren't, this isn't straightforwardly a moral enhancer, but these are morally relevant effects. So many people are on these drugs and making decisions, and that, those drugs are affecting their decisions. Oxytocin released by the oral contraceptive here. Sex, touching, massage, increases trust within groups, reduces trust without groups. Increases trustworthiness and cooperation within the group, reduces cooperation without groups. It bonds groups together more. So again, we're modified by the substances that we're taking. Sylvia Turbeck, in my, um, my PhD student with Miles Houston, showed that Propranolol reduces unconscious racism on the IAT, the Implicit Association Test. All of us are racist unconsciously. So we're, we're designed to pick up our group members. And of course we can overcome that through mixing and through um, affluent society and through cooperation. But there is inherent racism as you start to see in the US and Europe and so on. As soon as there's pressure, uh, the inherent racism emerges. Propranolol reduces that. Again, I'm not suggesting we should all be on propranolol. What it shows is that, of course, we can change uh, our behaviour and even our unconscious attitudes by changing our biology. Besides drugs, there are new, now uh, non-invasive brain stimulation techniques such as magnetic stimulation and, um, and uh, electrical stimulation. And again, that can be used to have moral effects. So in one study of the uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation to the right temporoparietal junction led people to be less willing to, um, to blame or judge as bad unsuccessful attempts to harm by somebody else. You can use transcranial electrical stimulation to make people better liars. You can use it to uh, enhance people's ability to uh, learn a new language or develop motor skills or to acquire numeracy. And you could also potentially use it to morally enhance people. I mentioned love. 
Um, scientists have been able to engineer monogamy in voles, a, a model of, of the human attachment system. And again, love consists of three phases, lust, attraction, attachment, each of them with different neurobiological underpinnings. And I'm writing a book with Brian Earp on love drugs, which should be coming out soon. In principle, you're able to modify each of these uh, phases. So oxytocin has been given to couples undergoing relationship therapy to promote uh, bonding. Ecstasy has been used again in couples therapy to enhance uh, people's openness to experience. Uh, Flibanserin, the female Viagra, has been developed to increase libido in women. So I'm not suggesting any of these are successful, but what they show in principle is that we could strategically target aspects uh, of our neurobiology to achieve the goals that we want. We had the debate last night on gene editing, genetic selection and gene editing pose the, uh, the prospect of radically changing human beings. This has already happened in non-human animals. You can make monkeys work harder through gene therapy. You can create mice that are resistant to obesity. You can create uh, mice that live twice as long. Uh, mice with better memory, voles which are monogamous. And my favourite is this one. So in the front you see a genetically modified mouse. In the back is a normal mouse and they're hungry and they're looking for food. They're running at 20 metres a minute and after 200 metres the normal mouse is exhausted and can't continue even though it's hungry. But after five kilometres Super mouse eventually gives up. Super, super mouse uh, has 10% the body fat, reproduces at the equivalent of a woman having a child at 80, has lower cholesterol levels, but has to eat twice as much. How did they create super mouse? They just changed a small aspect of the glucose cycle. We have a similar glucose cycle to the mouse. You could create a superhuman tomorrow. And the reason that super mice don't exist in nature is there's two, two reasons. One is that that mutation just never naturally occurred, or it did occur and it's too expensive to service because they have to eat twice as much. But what nature could have produced, we can produce in a laboratory. Now this, is, this mouse was created to study muscle wasting diseases like Duchenne's mus mu Duchenne muscular dystrophy. But what is used to study a disease can be used to enhance. Belgian blue cow, massive muscles. This cow was created on the basis of a human study of a small German family where the family don't produce myostatin because of a, 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 a genetic mutation. Myostatin turns off muscle development. They've used this in animals. You could also use it in humans to create uh, people like Arnold Schwarzenegger. Okay, so I, you know, we, we do have enhancements. We have modest enhancements in sport. We have modest cognitive enhancements. We're dipping our, our toes into the water of enhancing love. We have drugs that affect our moral decisions, but no straightforward moral enhancers. But it's only a matter of time before, be, before that science progresses and we have more potent ways of influencing our biology that has effects on uh, these sorts of values. How should we make decisions about this? Okay, so I started off with uh, this, this set of questions and I asked you, would you, should we allow people to increase their IQ from 100 to 160? One of the features of our decisions about moral issues, such as ethics, is we're prone to biases. We're prone to the status quo bias. We're prone to the nature bias. And we're averse to losses. So, Imagine instead of asking you about enhancement, I'd asked you about preservation. Imagine that I'd asked you, a child is born with an IQ of 160 and naturally the child's IQ will, will drop to average to 100. It won't be disabled, it'll just be average. Um, but there's something you can do. You can give, let's assume, choline. And that will stop the IQ dropping to 100. I'm sure if I asked you that, everyone would say yes. It should be permissible to give the choline. In fact, you'd say parents ought to give the choline unless they have a good reason not to, like it's expensive or it's got side effects or they have to save their other child's life or something. We ought to preserve the child's IQ at 160 because it's good. 
It's not like the child's hair color changing from blonde to brown, where we go, well, we must preserve the blonde hair. We've got to try to dye the hair to keep it the same. It actually, the reason that we think preservation is important is because it's better to have an IQ of 160 than 100. Oh, well, now let's go back to what I asked you. Child's born with an IQ of 100 and now giving choline can boost it up to 160. If you do nothing, the child's IQ will stay at 100. This is exactly the same scenario as here. At the end of the day, if you fail to do something, the child will be average. And if you act, you'll bring about a child with an IQ of 160. And my argument is, if the reason here was the goodness of having that IQ, the reason operates in this case. If you accept preservation, you ought to accept enhancement. People like Francis Cam are in favour of preservation, but they think there's a difference between preservation and enhancement. I can't see the difference. Maybe you can. Ethics is like physics. Um, it, physics in, involves vectors with a direction and a strength. And what we ought to do is weigh those vectors and decide what we overall have most reason to do. This is a familiar way of dis making decisions. So if you've got three values, cost, status and safety, which car you should choose will depend on balancing those reasons. So what are the reasons that should drive our decisions about human enhancement? Well, there's lots of different reasons and I'm just going to cover a few. The most important reason, and I think, and this is, you know, um, Anthony and I sort of, you know, love each other because we both got this common kind of uh, concern for well-being. Well-being is the common currency of ethics. If anything about your lives matter, what matters is how well it goes. And ethics really is about trying to trade off or to balance different people's well-being. But the important, one important question is, what is well-being? And there's a long philosophical tradition of discussion of this and um, broadly there are three ways of thinking about hedonistic conceptions say that what matters is happiness. Desire fulfillment theory or economics says that all that matters are preferences or desires and more objective views say that what matters are things to do with our nature as human animals like being social animals, social relationship, love, family, friends, being creative, achieving worthwhile things, uh, being, crea uh, being uh, having a physical life, sexual relationships. So whether you will answer the question of whether impulse control is a good thing or not will depend in part on which of these theories you subscribe to. It, from my view, the what we should be aiming for is something at the intersection. Those objectively valuable activities that give people pleasure and happiness and that they desire to be in, involved in. So one important vector is, is it going to make people's lives better? So one of the concerns about functional enhancement is will it be a welfare enhancement? And to answer that question you A need to settle on what you think is welfare or well-being and then you need to know the science of how that functional improvement affects well-being. Does better memory make your life go better? Well, it will depend on what sort of memory. If the memories are intrusive, you're unable to control them, it may actually make your life go worse. If it's remembering things at will that are of a use to you, it will promote well-being. The second major vector, and basically ethics, practical ethics, boils down to two issues, autonomy and well-being, balancing these, and then justice, how you balance everyone's autonomy and well-being. So that's like if, if you want the sort of crash course in ethics, um, that's what's really important. So when somebody says to me, you know, sh should we reduce people's uh, memory consolidation after traumatic events? I want to know, you know, is it going to affect their well-being? What does autonomy say about it? And then how does justice influence the decision? So um, one important issue is whether um, the sorts of uh, interventions will enhance freedom and autonomy or undermine it. And again, there's no simple answer to that. So I have a, a long kind of disagreement with John Harris, who's one of the sort of fathers in, in England of, of bioethics. And he's been a huge proponent of enhancement. He's written a book called Enhancing Evolution and Wonder Woman and Superman. And he's always banging the drum of enhancement, except in one case, in moral enhancement. He says that moral enhancement will undermine freedom. 
is that if we're caused to make a moral decision, it's no longer a moral decision. Um, he thinks the only kind of moral enhancement is cognitive enhancement. But I think this is too simplistic. There are certainly cases like a clockwork orange or a device that, that changed your desires to make you behave more morally. This would be undermining your freedom. But making somebody more empathetic um, doesn't make them less free. Otherwise, people who are more empathetic wouldn't be free. If you read Tolstoy and it suddenly opens your eyes and makes you more empathetic, you haven't undermined your freedom. And if you take a pill that has the same effect as reading Tolstoy, in my view, that doesn't undermine your freedom. So whether an enhancement promotes or undermines freedom will depend on the way it acts. One important kind of consequence of the importance of freedom is, is Mill's harm principle, that we ought to be free to act provided that we don't harm others, that the sole justification for coercion and limitation of freedom is harm to others. That seems a pretty benign and uncontroversial principle, except in enhancement, it dominates regulation. So for example, um, people who want to select the sex of an embryo or want to choose an embryo that's more intelligent than another aren't harming anyone, yet there are laws that prevent that. The argument is that it will create a social disturbance. So there will be a social consequence. So although there's no direct harm, no physical harm, there's indirect harm. But in the case of um, sex selection, it's easy to avoid that harm while protecting liberty, allow people sex selection for family balancing reasons. Allow, it's hard to see what the harm of allowing people to select the most intelligent of their 10 embryos is. Uh, nature could have selected that. Likewise, save your siblings. Creating one new child to serve as a stem cell donor for another doesn't harm anyone, yet until recently there were laws preventing it. Cloning is another example of, a, of, a, of something that's prohibited that has n no direct harm, assuming it's safe. Justice is the third important, important aspect about how to distribute resources and benefits in burdens. Um, another basic moral principle is a duty of easy rescue. When the cost to you of doing something is small and the benefit to doing it for others is large, you ought to do that. So organ donation is an example of that. Uh, many, I don't know what the organ donation rate in Canada is, but in Australia and the UK it's low because we don't even engage in a duty of easy rescue. Organ donation is, after death is a zero cost rescue. If morality requires anything, it requires you to donate your organs. But people are reluctant to donate their organs, reluctant to donate their sperm, reluctant to donate their eggs, reluctant to donate their um, embryos when they're no longer required, and reluctant to donate data to research. All of those would fall within this basic principles. Um, one of the most important principles that dominates the debate around human enhancement is the principle of respecting human dignity. So, when I give these talks in Germany, they say to me, look, the first article of the German constitution is always respect human dignity. And somehow this is meant to preclude engaging in enhancement or genetic selection. What Kant actually said is, uh, in one formulation of his categorical imperative, is that you must always treat uh, humanity, whether in your own person or the person of another, never merely as a means, but always at the same time as an end. Never merely as a means, but at the same time as an end. So the paradigm of the violation of this is slavery. Treating somebody purely as a means. But when you have a saviour sibling, when you create a saviour sibling, are you using that individual purely as a means? Well, you could be if you treated that individual as a slave, as that Ishiguru novel um, shows. That's a violation of the Kantian inference. But in the cases where they've actually been created, they've been loved as an end, they have good lives, and this isn't a violation of this, of this Kantian principle. Likewise, the creation of designer babies or sex selection could instrumentalise the child if the parents treat the child in a certain way, but that's not necessary. The whole objection that Michael Sandel and others have around hyperparenting, instrumentalisation of children, the resistance to enhancing children turns on actually a contingent factor of parenting about whether 
parents choose to control the destiny of their child. And of course, you don't need enhancement to do that. This is, a, this is a picture of Lang Lang, the famous pianist, whose father famously told him to commit suicide after he failed to get into the Beijing Central Conservatory at the age of nine. This is an example of parental hyperagency. Um, whether it's right or wrong, I think, turns on evaluating Lang Lang's autonomy and well-being. It might not be wrong. But this occurred without enhancement. If you're concerned about that, you ought to, treat, you ought to address that independently. Likewise, the claim that cloning is an affront to human dignity, one in 300 people are clones. They're identical twins. Are these people less autonomous, less individual, less possessing of human dignity? No. Another common objection in the enhancement debate is that we'll be forced to engage in it in, in order to, to keep up. So that if one person gets smarter, we all have to get smarter. Coercion is, occurs when the status quo is not, no longer available. When, when you say to somebody, give me your money or I'll kill you, that's coercion. You're reducing their options, you're getting them to do what you want, you're reducing their well-being and options. When enhancers come on board, the option of competing is, is no longer available if you want to have the same relative advantage. So there is a form of coercion. But coercion is not always bad. So when I say to my child, if you don't eat your vegetables, you won't get dessert, it's a beneficial form of coercion. So whether the fact that uh, an enhancement society is coercive is wrong will turn on whether the actual effects of the enhancement are good or bad. I, can't, I can no longer write my manuscripts freehand. I have to use a computer to be competitive. It's coercive. I have to use the internet. I have to use a mobile phone. Now, whether that's good or bad turns on the effects of those things, not on the fact that they're coercive. So to return to the example of the paedophile, um, the drug cyproterone acetate is widely used in Europe as a hormonal castrator. It reduces sex drive. Alan Turing was given this drug. <coughs> Uh, he was forced to take it because he was a homosexual and ultimately committed suicide. And I think that's wrong. But do I think that people should have the choice whether to take it to reduce their re-offence or the choice to take it in trade for the reduction of a fair sentence? Yes. That's not coercion. You can choose the status quo. So even something as controversial as modification of sexual desire can be addressed by appealing to these principles. And if somebody voluntarily chooses to take uh, hormonal castration, in my view, that's acceptable. The best example of, a, uh, of an involuntary enhancer, I think, comes in the form of Ritalin. One study from the New England Journal of Medicine uh, several years ago showed that if you put criminals who are convicted of violent offences who have attention deficit disorder on Ritalin, you reduce violent reoffence by 30%. It's a massive reduction. I think there's a real question whether that should be obligatory because the Ritalin will reduce the violent reoffence, but it will also help the individual. It will help the individual to delay gratification, exert greater control over their life, realise their own values and actually have a better life. It's both a prudential and a moral enhancer. So some enhancers ought to be just allowed, some ought to be banned, but perhaps some ought to be uh, obligatory. Will this create greater inequality and discrimination? Francoise is there, I'm sure she'll have a lot to say about that. Um, iodizing salt would cost two to three cents per person per year and add a billion IQ points to the world's population. Um, and, and that's the most cost-effective enhancer we could introduce. It's cheap. Um, the internet and computing have diffused and become widely available. And ultimately, how we make these kinds of interventions available turns on our society and how we choose to uh, provide them through the healthcare system and through public welfare. 
Okay, let me finish. One of the characteristics of the human condition is that we can make moral decisions. And once we have the power to choose to do something, we become responsible for the outcome insofar as we can avoid it and we can foresee it. Um, unless you think there is a deep moral distinction between what you do and what you fail to do or between intention and foresight. But in my view, if we choose not to enhance people, we're responsible for the conditions of their life. And to give one example, there's been a vigorous discussion in the literature we were discussing earlier today about the role of empathy in moral decision making. In my book, Unfit for the Future, I argued that empathy was an important component of moral capacity. Paul Bloom and Peter Singer have argued that empathy is a bad thing because it makes us focus on small groups. In fact, empathy has been reducing. This is a study from, starting from 1979, of the empathy of American college students through a meta-analysis of all psychological research that involved empathy measures. And what you can see is, particularly after the year 2000, empathy has been statistically significantly reduced. So you've got to ask the question, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Because now we, can, we might be able to do something about it. If we could do something about it, um, maybe we should accelerate it, as Paul Bloom would have us, or maybe we should increase it. What's very unlikely is that we just happen to be naturally at the right level. Uh, so science brings power, and with power comes responsibility. OK, I think we can make progress on human enhancement. We first need to begin to understand our own limitations. Uh, and we need to evaluate all ways of addressing those limitations. So there's four ways of improving human well-being. One is to change the natural environment. Two is to change the social environment. Three, psychological, but lastly, biological. I'm not arguing that we should only do biological enhancement, but we should also consider it. Um, we need to develop a secular ethics. Uh, we need to enhance people's freedom. We need to aim for objective goods. We need to engage in easy rescues. Um, and so, in my view, we ought to relax the, the ban on doping in sport and allow doping which is safe and which is consistent with the spirit of sport, but doping within a normal physiological reign would achieve that. Hormonal castration of paedophiles ought to be available. Cognitive enhancement, I think, is a moral imperative. Sex selection ought to be allowed for family balancing. We ought to consider love drugs. Uh, and I don't think there's anything wrong with, uh, with save your siblings. There may be some forms of enhancement which are legally required. I mentioned Ritalin for attention deficit disorder in, in criminals um, and genetic selection against psychopathy and other highly antisocial traits may be something that we make a decision to require. Enhancement gets to the fundamental essence of ethics about whether we should respect natural human variation and what nature delivers or whether we should choose to be better. We tried to be better by using education, by diet, by social reform, and I think we can also use science to try to engineer ourselves to achieve the values that are important. Thank you. We just did a, a sort of lecture on doping in sports. Um, it, it's true that there, there are positional, like performance enhancement in sport is a positional good, but it's also a non-positional good. So, uh, so steroids yeah. act to increase recovery from, from injury. Hmm. So that's... So it's the fact that it's a non-positional good in some ways that's the key to your case. 
Well, uh, uh, positional goods, as, as the example of the IQ increase of the whole population, um, can also have collective benefits. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the reason why I'm interested in performance enhancement is not particularly in sport, but actually for our own lives, we were talking about this again, there's a real question about whether people should be taking human growth hormone, testosterone, as levels drop. Now, the experiment of hormone replacement therapy in postmenopause of women showed it causes cancer. But you can't assume that's going to be the case. So just because something drops naturally um, doesn't mean that that's going to achieve what we want out of our lives. So you know, I think, for example, muscle strength reduces significantly and falls are a major cause of illness in the elderly. Maybe the elderly should be on low doses of, of uh, anabolic steroids. Mm -hmm. But we don't do those sorts of experiments because it's enhancement of normal. Mm -hmm. It's not treating a disease. Um, so I, I think that there could be non-positional benefits as well. Actually, I mean, I didn't sort of talk about all the great things uh, that are associated with human beings and their great achievements. I think they're huge positive things. Um, and so I think there's great promise. Uh, I just think that we can't be confident, as most people seem to be, that, you know, we've just got it in us and we're going to, you know, things are all going to be okay. Um, I think there's, you know, we, and so far we've made enormous achievements. Uh, and so far I think that, you know, things have turned out for the better. Um, I just don't think you can continue to extrapolate that curve given the reality of the extraordinary limitations that we have. So, you know, I, I, I don't want to, I, I, it was quite a pessimistic picture, but, you know, I think that Pinker is right. You know, there are two sides to our nature and insofar as we can use biology to bring out the better sides and to address the darker sides, I think that's a good, good thing. Um, provided it imposes reasonable risks on people, it's consistent with some respect for autonomy and you know, it fits within an ethical framework. But you know, I, I, I personally think there's, so this, I think there's something wrong with abortion and destruction of embryos because I think that human beings are like a little work of art. And so there's something good about bringing them into existence. But we could just make them better. <laughs> I, I'm not a sort of believer that nature is just generating constantly the, you know, the, the best works of art. I think, there's, like yeah, yeah, I think there's inherent I think, I think it's wrong to destroy embryos. Um, it's not hugely wrong, and I don't think people should be you know, prevented from doing it, but you know, I think they should donate them to research or to other couples rather than destroying them. Um, so you know, but, so I, you know, that might come as a surprise to you, but, but uh, it's not because I think the embryo has a moral status. I think that the future person, will, it will be like, you know, should you destroy this painting or not? Well, you know, it's not a living being, but it's, if it's good, it's... it's uh, and I think if we can shift the balance to, to people being better, then there's going to be more room to, to bring them into existence. Thank you for your Two scenarios to sort of tease out the situation. Now, 
So suppose I, I bought this tree and I wanted to climb up the tree. And then there is this uh, sketchy looking guy in a trench coat. And he's like, you know, you don't actually, you don't really, you know, you need to use a rope and, and work your way up the tree. There's this drum I can give you to sort of um, levitate and then you can get up the tree. Um, and so I, I to myself, I think, well, I suppose I really want to get up the tree, but I don't know, there's something that feels wrong about this. Now, uh, another situation that I can take is this. I'm writing a test, uh, uh, of course, actually with the test, you, you, don't, you don't use the text, but you know, you know, you know, you know. So, and then perhaps you know, there's someone that I'll write next to me is allowed to use uh, a textbook or a notebook. So, um, where I'm doing a close book test, to so you know, open book test. So, basically, the interest I'm really getting at is, is that there is a sense in which uh, genetic enhancement. Uh, appears as though one is cheating, really. So, so what I'm going for is this. There are certain sets of rules that we, we often uh, find. For example, you know, when you climb a tree, there's a certain way that you climb the tree, and when you take that test, there's a certain way that you take that test. Now, with uh, genetic enhancement, it's not so much saying, let's improve upon the rules, but it's more saying, let's destroy the rules all together and then just move, I don't know really, but um, I was hoping you could address that. I, I do realise that you mentioned something about nature bias and then you had the slide of, you know, presentation about things that are uh, amazing um, I am committed, at least my leadership I'm trying to tease out, is committed to the view that, you know what, present, presentation is actually a kind of wrong, but at least uh, well, you sort of touched on lots of different things, and so I, I lots of sort of important issues. So I, I, I'll just pick out what I think is the main one. Um, so um, let's take just some some parameter that goes between you know uh, you know zero to a hundred, and as and, and as nature would have it, you're at at ninety. And I'm at 30. So genetic enhancement would, would enable me to get to 90. And what you're saying is, now that'd be cheating, because we're disturbing what, what nature set out to kind of create. It's not like we've both got an open book or we've both got a closed book in the test. It's you've got 80, and I've got 30, or 90, and I've got 30. And so I, I see enhancement as extremely liberating for people. Um, of course, if you started at 80 and you went up to 150 and I stayed at 30, that would be really bad. That's like, not only do you have an open book, you've got a calculator and a computer and I've just got the, you know, I'm just trying to work it out with my, with my own head. And I think that's the, the issue that I disagree with many people who object, is that we could use this to address great natural inequality. Um, that exists. And it, it's usually the people who are at the top end of privilege who are saying, oh, no, no, we can't disturb the system. <laughs> We've got to protect the system as it is. Because, you know, you've all got an IQ over 120 just being here. Um, and I, I, I personally don't... Now, people do have that intuition. They think that, that we should just preserve natural difference. And my, my question is, is natural difference good? Is it good for that individual? Or is it good for society? And there's lots of natural differences that are good, you know, for either or both of those. Psychopathy is, a, is an example that I mentioned. Probably it was advantageous to groups. That's why it's persisted at such a high level, 1% of the population. Is it good today? No. It destroys countries, corporations, and, you know, puts the whole world at risk, given... So I think it's just a question of what... What genetic enhancement are you talking about? Who's going to get it? And I don't think there's a determinism about that. People have this sort of social determinism. They say, if enhancement is made available, it's going to necessarily increase inequality. Sure, mobile phones were available to a few people initially, but now they're widely available. Um, and there's no reason to think that, you know, in the long term, in 100 years, 200 years, these sorts of changes uh, couldn't have 
an impact in a widespread way. Now, will they affect everyone? I don't know. On that scale, are you saying that um, parts of the 30 and parts of the 90, what should really happen is that the parts of the 30 should catch up with parts of the 90, and perhaps everyone of the 30 should catch up with the 90? Well, if you're concerned about equality, that's what you should do. I mean, I'm not so concerned about equality. Um, I think a level of, of inequality can be justifiable, provided, you know, as we all see, the difference principle all works to the benefit of people at the lower end. But those are the questions you need to address. It's not to say that enhancement will necessarily lead to injustice. It's what's your conception of justice? How would enhancement be made available? And so enhancement sounds really scary, but education is enhancement. You know, initially only a small number of people could read and write. Um, and that was a massive enhancement. Uh, and so I, I think biologic, there's no, reason to treat biological enhancements any differently to other enhancements that ultimately affect our brain and our biology. Oh, hello, Louis. How are you? I saw you were on the staff. I hadn't seen you around. I wondering whether you might be thinking a bit of an optimistic picture of some of the pharmaceutical options that are being offered in the I mean, it's a, it's a sort of... Well, I think one candidate that will sort of emerge in the next few years is modafinil, um, that it's a drug initially developed for the treatment of narcolepsy. It's a new eugenoric, or eugeroric. It's a new kind of, of, um, of, of substance that... Um, I've had it a couple of times for jet lag, and, you know, it's, for me, it's much better than caffeine. Some of my colleagues take it regularly. I don't know what the long-term effects are, um, and, and I don't know whether it has actual cognitive downsides. There's some literature that shows that you know, it reduces creativity in highly creative people and has you know, mixed effects according to where you start on the curve. I think we need a lot more data and we need better... I mean, the kind of psychopharmaceuticals is the dark ages, really. It's, you know, we're still talking about kind of blunderbuss therapy and even you know, modafinil, these things, they're not going to be what is around in... 20 or 30 years. Um, but, you know, I, I think we're on this, we've got this exponential curve, and I think we'll start to see a lot more fine grained ways of intervening in the mind. And then the question is, you know, are you just going to limit this to disease, or are you going to give people control, uh, or are you going to require it in certain ways? And I, I, think we need, I think we need to have that debate now, because already in my, in Oxford, Typical disease is doing deep brain stimulation, you probably know about this, for anorexia. So causes very chronic severe anorexics to want to eat. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, they certainly put on weight. They certainly want to eat. But maybe it's introducing you know, a, a, an obsession with eating uh, that really isn't authentically theirs. Or maybe it's removing an obsession to diet that is enabling the real self to emerge. Um, that's occurring, and you know, once you get more fine-grained, non-invasive brain stimulation, you have to put electrodes into the brain, um, and you can penetrate deeper uh, and more precisely. You know, it's a lot of things. I think are going to become possible. So, I, you know, I, I share my scepticism with you, a pharmaceutical. Company. I also think that's a problem of capitalism. I don't think we should be looking to pharmaceutical companies to improve our well-being. I think we should be investing more in government-sponsored research aimed at enabling people to have better lives. And I think the whole incentive structure for science and research is, is partly mistaken. But that's another debate that doesn't apply necessarily to this. Okay, Corey. Uh, thanks. Um, just a couple of questions related to your client's slides. Sort of <laughs> <laughs> are you the cat? Are you? I, mean, I know this was a client's thought, right? But I mean, might, might be interesting. So the first is that, I mean, you brought the client slide in the context of this 
discussion of organ donation, uh, and your, your claim is that it doesn't violate the second formulation of the categorical imperative. But in fact, Todd has very uh, express, explicit views on organ donation. He actually refers to this as the partial murder of one's own body. And he says that in the case of disease, the disease organ, one is permitted to remove it. But in the case of, for instance, transplanting one's tooth to another person's mouth, uh, that he refers to that explicitly as partial murder. So, I mean, uh, the grounds for this are, you know, not directly connected to the second formulation, but he does refer to it as a kind of violation of one's own animality, treating one's animality as a means uh, rather than as a man. So just by way of a footnote to that quote, or that, 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 that slide. Yeah, he's also, he also objects to suicide, um, which I think is a mistake. Well, he so. objects to suicide under certain axioms. He doesn't object to the act of suicide. He objects to certain suicide that would follow on the basis of the adoption of certain axioms. So, but he, in fact, allows the metaphysics of morals certain cases of suicide, but under different axioms than those considered in the metaphysics of in, in the uh, in the, um, the second point is that, I mean, so this slide, I think, if I recall correctly, came up under the discussion also of the savior siblings. And I mean, that at least is clearly ruled out by the second formulation, right? Or indeed by the formula of autonomy later on, which is to say, well, I mean, a savior sibling to some extent doesn't have a kind of a choice in the matter of whether their organs are used in that. Or at least there's a kind of a bias in favor of a certain use of their body. So, I mean, there's a certain, it wasn't clear to me that you were presupposing yeah. that the Norman medical yeah. framework. Yeah, no, 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 no. It was clear to me that you weren't. No. But I mean, the point is that there's there's certain Kantian grounds one might cite. Yeah, but, but the, the, problem, the problem, well, I, I look, I, I, I don't particularly care what Kant said. So, <laughs> and I was really using that for people often give that formulation as an objection. They have the, in the bioethics, it's not in the Kantian, in the bioethics, people say, you're treating the child purely as a means. And I think that's a mistake. You, you, you can be treating the child both as a means and an end. So that's all I wanted to say with that. But in terms of your broader point around being able to consent and, and, and being able to autonomously make a decision about their organs, you're exactly right. But that applies to all of children and embryos. So unfortunately, there are some decisions so enhancement, or you know, genetic selection or enhancement is one where you can't wait to ask somebody, well, did you want to be selected or did you want to have your cystic fibrosis cured as an embryo or did you want to have more, you know, more genes for intelligence? It has, you have to make a decision on behalf of the child in those cases. So that, that principle just isn't applicable to lots of areas of interest. And there I think we have to answer the question, will it increase the child's autonomy in the future or w and will it make the child's life better? And that's where I think that you know, improving impulse control at the low end is something that we ought to do even though the child hasn't consented. So the, the paradigm example of this is intersex conditions. So I was involved in this big project. So children born with ambiguous genitalia historically were surgically operated, reduced the size of the clitoris, fashion of vagina, allow them to be a functional woman. On the, on the claim that their parents would better adjust to them, society would better adjust to them, they'd have a defined role, and so on. And, and this was done. Then many intersex people said, we don't feel that was right. We should be left with the decision to decide on surgery or our own sex when we're capable. And I, I, that's what I would do if I were a parent. But this isn't an easy thing to answer because you've just got two mutually exclusive trajectories. One where you might have psychological problems, adjustment, etc. Um, but, um, but the ability to make a choice about sex in the future uh, versus one where psychological and social factors supposedly are addressed but you don't have as much choice over anatomy. Now, there are just different costs and benefits around that. And, and ultimately, I think ethics is about existential choices. you just got to see where you think the vector of reasons is going and choose that option. <laughs> so I, I think ultimately it's about making choices in a, in a morally uncertain world. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so 
It depends on your concept of authenticity again. And so I, I have a, a concept of authenticity that's quite grounded in autonomy and constructing the sort of person that you want to be. So, you know, on that view, it, it's really a tool to realising, you know, what you most value. If you think it should be more essentialist and consistent with uh, the true, well, the, whatever this, I mean, you know, I think the true self is the rational self. <laughs> but, you know, if you think the true self is some set of dispositions and attitudes, then you could choose against that. But in the case of, you know, love, I don't see what the problem is with me and my partner taking oxytocin to you know increase our sense of connection after massage or something like that and if we enjoy it and we both want to do it I don't I don't care if it's not authentic um, so I, I think it, it, what what matters are you know these other sorts of values but I, I know my colleague Alec, my, one of my students Alexander Erler has this quite essentialist view of enhancement he thinks that it could undermine who we really are um, you know, I, I, I don't really know who I am and I think people evolve and, and that's, you know, that's what you, you know, that's what's great about people is they, they can improve. Yeah. I think it is a very well real question, right? How real is it if it's demonification? Look, everything is just a series of electrical firings in our brain, you know, that come from different sort of places and you know, we have this illusion of deep reality, but you know, I um, you know, I, I'm sort of quite a reductionist, really, and I, I think that it really just matters what you think a good life for you is and how you achieve that. And so, uh, you know, I can see that some people will have objections. Don't take it. That's where the liberty principle. So I don't get. If you don't like love drugs, don't take them. You know, no one's forcing you to. But if I if I want to take them, why should you say that your concept of authenticity should rule my life? And that's what you see in the enhancement of these very narrow, moralistic, traditional Judeo-Christian ideas of the world order and our nature and relationship to God. Yeah. Fortunately, they're being overturned at last, but you know, it's too late as far as I'm concerned. Good for us, Mark. So, understanding uh, correctly, you have to understand that the world is You know, to be honest with you, I agree with you. So I'm pessimistic as well. Can take that? <laughs> <laughs> I think there's about, about five cameras now. Never see. I feel like I'm like, you know, I'm doing one of those tech talks. You got to walk up and down and kind of look really beautiful. And, and um, so uh, I agree with you. I'm pessimistic, but I think uh, a it's going to happen, and b as we talked about last night, and b we ought to start taking a lead on trying to change history and the way we use these things. And so, I, you know, I, I think, yeah, in, in all likelihood, it's going to be, it's going to increase inequality and it's going to be a bad thing, but it's not inevitable. And, you know, I'm sort of optimistic that we do. I, I think freedom is, we have much less freedom than we think we have, but I think we still have a little bit. And I think this is an area where we still probably have a little bit of freedom to shape things. And so, I, I think trying to implement these bans, um, as the doping example shows, just doesn't work. Um, so you, you, need to, you need to rethink the approach and trying to prevent sort of things that people perceive to be beneficial to them in a global environment is just not going to work. And so I think we, we need to sort of take a lead in saying, is this important? Let's make it available to people who deserve it. Now, you know, 
Now, it's sort of wildly optimistic, you're right. Kadassa jointly. Oh, you're my you're, you're my uh, you're my ally who voted for everything. I can't wait for this question. Oh no! Don't break my heart. It's only the last six months of life. And I think it's garbage. You should be able to die if you want to. And it's not because your life isn't worth living. So I think this, th there are two justifications that are commonly given for euthanasia. One is that um, the, the well-being, beneficence, you know, relief of suffering argument. Nobody has ever shown when life is not worth living. And I think that's a crappy justification for euthanasia. It's the autonomy justification. That, and that means you can choose to die under any circumstance, whether you've got a psychiatric condition, as long as you're, you know, competent, whether you're just old or whether you just want to die. And so I think if you take that justification, you're exactly right that this is wildly too restrictive. Can I just follow up with a quick corollary that's related? Um, uh, in terms of a clinician, um, I think that there's a difference between the way that it seems to be handled with a person who comes into a clinician's office and says, hey, I'm having, you know, self harm uh, ideas. Well, you know, the, the, the view is, seems to me that, that it's, um, you know, are you a danger to yourself or others? Well, I, I would say that as a society or clinicians should look at it from the standpoint of are you a danger to others? Yeah, I agree. Uh, it seems like I'm just taking out that first clause because they say, you know, we're talking about involuntarily. Uh, I, 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 I completely agree. Someone I don't see why you think there's a disagreement. Their own body, not to other people. Yeah. Their own body. Yeah, I agree. And I think yeah. that's an injustice. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I, I agree. I've also written on that. So uh, it, you know, I, th I, I think, it, and you know, it's just, um, there's an enormous amount of paternalism still alive and well. And you know, you just sort of described a very good case. So yeah, I, 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 I... So you mentioned that the beginning of the talk, how uh, diseases are defined as two statistical, two distributions away from the mean, and then last night on the talk, uh, the scientist Dr. Edel talked about how some of these technologies still aren't ready and um, they're only so good and you always have sort of a mean of how effective they are and also 
of safety or input of safety a bit um, later on in the talk. And obviously that market will also have variants of the, we can assume, in the call of normal distribution. So how safe or how good should it be before we start acting upon enhancement and then also that yeah, so when it comes to adults, I don't think it has to be safe at all. People just have to be told the risks. But then there's a distributive justice argument that if they start imposing heavy burdens on the healthcare system, that's an argument to restrict access because of the indirect consequence of, of increase in health resources. But given that people can smoke and drink and, you know, and incur quite large healthcare costs, I think they can also incur quite large enhancement costs in the project. So when it comes to adults, I think that you know you should tolerate qu quite significant risk commensurate with other risks people are allowed to take with their life. When it comes to children, I think you have to have a much higher bar and you have to be much more confident that, that there's a clearly beneficial risk. But there's never going to be no risk. Nothing in life is risk-free. So this is another mistake that people have, that they say, you know, because you're trading health or risking health for some enhancement, we ought not to you know, take any risks with our health. But health is just, in my view, an instrumental good. We risk our health when we climb mountains. So you mentioned the, the tree you know, sort of example. You know, some people want to climb mountains with oxygen. Some people don't want to have oxygen. You know, they're going to have different risk profiles. That's their value. Um, and we let them do that. And I think this, the same applies to, to enhancements. But for children, I think we need to have a higher bar. But that bar, I think, will will be achieved in certain things. So I'm not as sceptical as, as uh, David was. So I got this paper called The God Machine, which is meant to be a response to Harris, where I sort of take seriously his concern about undermining freedom. And I imagine that you know, we can put chips in people's brains that, that measure all of their mental states. And, and, and this chip does one thing. It just detects if there's an intention to kill an innocent person. It also gets data from all around the world. And then it just flips your intention so that you just change your mind. So you don't, you're not even aware of it. And I said, in this case, this would undermine your freedom to fall, Harris's concern after Milton, that we have the freedom to fall. You would not be able to fall into killing somebody else. So that freedom would have been removed. And I said, you know, A, this could be a freedom worth giving up, but it also could be an expression of our freedom. So say I choose to have the chip. Has it undermined my freedom or has it promoted it? Is it a Ulysses-style contract of an absolute sort of sense where now I can made absolute control? Is it inauthentic or is it authentic? And in my view, if I, if I think about it and know it and want to constrain myself in that way, it's an expression of my freedom. I think freedom is being able to set your own rules or constrain your own behaviour to achieve your goals. So I think if, if I choose to do it, it's an expression of my freedom. So, you know, I, but that's why I, I'm, I think it, this, I don't have a very sort of deep concept of authenticity above and beyond, you know, how you want your life to unfold. Um, and, and that seems to me to be, you know, a very good way of, so for example, if I could, if I could dial up my, um, 
So I do a lot of exercise and, you know, probably more than most people, but, you know, there's a lot of times I don't want to do it. And I know I should. If I could dial up that I have the motivation according to a program and dial down my alcohol and caloric consumption so that, you know, I would do it. And I think that's an authentic decision. Now, is it really me that's kind of now exercising? Well, I'll be experiencing it, um, and maybe it's not all fully authentic, but I'd, I'd rather live in that world where I can exercise. And we will, the anorexia case shows, and the motivational enhancement shows, we will be able to control our own desires. Um, so then I think that, and, but I think this is a really deep question that we, you know, we need to think about. Okay, so we're over time, so we should uh, thank our speaker.